Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. I'm Fabiana Bacchini, Executive Director of the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation, or CPBF. We are a charitable organization, and our mission is to empower families of premature babies through support and education. This Premier Chat series is one of the many initiatives we have to bring information for NICU families and healthcare professionals. Here, every Friday, we talk with experts, researchers, and parents who share with us their knowledge and experience. Also on our website, canadianpremies.org, parents will find all kinds of resources and support. And today we are going to talk with Dr. Ann Sings, an, uh, a neonatologist and founder of the Canadian Neonatal Follow-Up Network about a project to help preemies with their language development. The study took place at 10 neonatal follow-up programs across Canada, she will talk about what parents and your neonatal follow-up team did in Vancouver. And there'll be a lot of practical tips for uh, our families. And I have the pleasure to bring here, live from Vancouver, Dr. Sims, a neonatologist and clinical professor. She worked as a neonatologist in Montreal from 1994 to 1999, and at BC Women's Hospital from 1999 until her retirement in May 2021. She's currently a researcher at the BC Children's Hospital Research Institute. Dr. Sins, thank you so much for joining us here today. Hi, it's great to be here again. I love this opportunity to reach out to a wider audience, including our parents. Um, and as I'll talk to you um, today, it's been really fun to involve parents in our um, in our research. Yeah, it's been great and uh, we are very excited today to launch a video that we create in collaboration with the Canadian Neonatal Follow-Up Network. And the video is a day in the neonatal follow-up uh, for families and we hope many healthcare professionals share with their families because it just really highlights the importance of those appointments and how to prepare. I'm just going to play the video for one minute uh, and the video is, is available on our website. Give me just one second here. Here you go. It's a, a day in the follow-up clinic. After you take your baby home from hospital, your baby's development will be checked in the neonatal follow-up clinic. Every follow-up appointment is important for assessing your baby's growth and development and identifying strengths and possible challenges so that early interventions can begin if needed. The clinic will not replace your baby's doctor. To help you prepare for your follow-up appointments, let's join Jojo and Jojo's family. Here we go. Let me just remove this. Yes, so the whole video is available on our website, and I hope many of you can uh, go to the website, check out the link, and share with your families. So, Dr. Sins, I'm going to bring your slides up, and to all of you watching us live, please do send your questions uh, and insights that Dr. Sins, you address them at the end of her presentation. So, the floor is yours. Thank you. So today is exciting because I'm going to talk about the research we've done, but not in a medical scientific, but rather as the journey that we took during, um, uh, during this research study. Um, and I've called it, it takes a team to help a child, the Vancouver parent epic um, story. So we had um, funding from um, CIHR, which funds most Canadian research, has um, opportunities to do research that is patient oriented. And we are part of a Childbright um, network. And we called our group of studies uh, Parent Epic. I've talked to you before about what we called AIM-1, about engaging parents to co-create definitions of neurodevelopmental impairment. Um, but this is the first time I'm talking to you about the initiatives we took um, how to, about how to improve developmental outcomes using the follow-up program um, infrastructure. So what do we want to improve? Um, and why did we 
choose language? Well, I think most of us can appreciate that language is an important area um, in our lives. It's important for communicating um, with others and uh, important for success in school and beyond. But it's also important because in the first few years of life, the brain is still developing. And so there's this plasticity, this ability for the brain to um, change and improve that we can build on. The other interesting thing, um, as I'll talk a little bit about, is when we look at how to improve language, uh, involving parents and family is the best way to do it. So um, this is a, a, a scientific study, so we have to start with some evidence and facts. So the first thing we did was to um, look and see what other researchers had found. Um, so uh, Dr. Natalie Forte in Montreal um, and the team there did what we call a systematic review and looked at everything that was published. And the themes that came out um, that showed promise is uh, something called the infant's behavior and mother-child interaction, which looks specifically at children born preterm. Um, then there's a program called Reach Out and Read, which has shown about uh, uh, the way that you can involve parents in um, reading to improve language. There's another program on parent anticipatory guidance and parent coaching. So again, you'll see the, the importance of parents in here. And then um, lastly, how by supporting um, mother's mental health and well-being also actually helps language. Now, um, the next question is, how are you going to make an important change? And in the Canadian Neonatal Network, they developed something called um, EPIC. And the CPBF has um, been involved in EPIC before. And I don't expect you to be able to see this, um, read this slide, but the important thing is that EPIC is a well-defined um, process. There's a workshop you can take. There are 10 different steps and each step has worksheets um, and it guides you through how to do it. And you'll get a, a feel for that from some of my slides. So um, as part of this study, I was leading it in, in Vancouver and I wanted to share with you um, what we did. So as I indicated in my title, it takes a team. And our team involved many of our, um, sorry, healthcare professionals um, in our clinic, our nurses, our speech language pathologists, occupational and physiotherapist, educational consultant. Um, and one of the things that was important to me was that we involve parents. And we have um, a lovely family with Brett and Diane Bouchelak, um, parents to Emma, um, who joined us faithfully for our monthly meetings for about at least two years. Um, so the first thing we did is we said, what's the problem in, in Vancouver? And in the Canadian Neonatal Follow-Up Network through our clinics, um, we're able to collect with parents' consent information about how um, children born at less than 29 weeks gestation, how they do when they're 18 months. And what you can see in the slide is that on the far right hand side, the tallest bar um, indicating where there's um, the most children who have delays is, is language. So it made sense for us to focus on that. And the first step that um, we go through is identifying the problem. And so we had lots of wonderful sit around the table and think about the problem. So the first thing we did is we said, well, in our clinic, 
um, the speech language pathologist doesn't actually see anybody until the kids are three years old. Um, and we start, you know, asking a few questions and looking at language at 18 months. But if we're going to improve language at 18 months, we're going to have to do something before that. So that was our first aha moment is we have to think about language before kids come to clinic at 18 months. Um, one of the next things we do is we look at what resources um, we have, which in EPIC is called the driving forces and the resisting forces. Um, so we looked at the resources we had and we identified it was a librarian in the NICU. We have lots of interested in parents. Um, we were in our neonatal follow-up program. We reach out to parents while they're still in the NICU and there's teaching that goes in on in the NICU um, and amongst other things. So we had an idea of what we could work with. Um, as we move on through EPIC, um, we have to decide what we're going to um, do. And so in our brainstorming, we came up with um, three possible ideas. One was, can we increase parent awareness at the four month um, follow up visit about language development? Um, can we promote reading books at the four month visit? Or should we actually start by educating our follow up staff about language development? Because as I showed, we hadn't been thinking much about language in the early days. Um, and we then um, had to score um, the three possibilities uh, under the five different questions, and we come up with an aggregate score um, as to what's most feasible to help us choose our priority. And we decided on educating the follow-up staff about language development because it was feasible. Um, and it also felt like a very good place to start. Um, so how are we going to do that? I was fortunate that I've worked with Dr. Janet Worker, who's a researcher at the University of British Columbia. Um, and she's done some work uh, on language. So uh, Dr. Sugden, who works with her, was happy to come and give us um, a talk and to create a PowerPoint that we could share with our clinic. Um, and I asked her to focus on language development in the first year of life actually starting um, when most babies are still in the womb and to focus on prematurity. So um, the way it works in our EPIC process, if you have to set an aim statement. Um, so we said we wanted to improve the awareness of follow-up clinic staff to 90%, the import, um, the, of the importance of language development, and we want to do this by May 2018. Um, so I'm going to show you a few slides from Nicole's talk. So that worked very well. We discovered by um, tracking how many people attended that our education days were actually only reaching out to just over half of our team. Um, and so it took a little bit longer with, you know, people get sick and things like that um to reach out to everybody um but by the end of october we would reached our goal of 96 percent of our team um watching it but we also had aims and one thing was to attend it but we wanted to make sure they got something out of the talk so we asked uh the team members to write down one lesson they learned from the talk um, and we got that. I wanted to share um, one or two slides from Nicole's um, talk, which was another aha moment in our research. Um, so in this um, slide, which looks at 
a baby from when they're in the womb um, and it sort of starts at about 24 weeks and goes up to the first year of um, life she shared with us all the research about what babies in the womb can actually do so they can hear and as you get closer to term they can distinguish between mom's voice and dad's voice they can tell the difference between ba and da they can tell the difference between what language you're speaking they can recognize things that are familiar and so a lot of what um Nicole talked to us in her slide, we were able to build on in the future um, uh, groups that we had. Um, the other things that uh, we learned about in the talk is, well, what can you do to support language? And there were um, three themes, which she went into in more detail, but the first thing is babies learn best when things are familiar. It's just actually like all of us, we need to hear things more than once to learn. So things that are familiar, that are repeating, are important. The other th um, the next thing um, listed here is redundant co-occurring cues, but what that really means is if a baby experiences things with more than one sense. So if the baby is um, with, for example, mum and feeling mum's touch and is seeing her face, um, that helps the learning experience as well. And um, the third thing is that babies need to be able to interact with people um, to help learn language as well. So that was our first cycle. Um, and most of these cycles, took somewhere between one to six, six months. In the next cycle, um, because we were working with nine other follow-up programs and we were having um, regular teleconferences, we were sharing what we were learning and doing. So we heard from some of the other follow-up programs that they had teamed up with their local library. So we thought, we have access to the librarian and we got in touch with the Vancouver Public Library who has created this book called The Reading Tree. And The Reading Tree is a lovely story. And at the end of it, it also has information easy to understand for parents about what they can do to support their, their infant's um, language development. And the interesting thing is the public library was trying to distribute this book to all newborn babies, but they weren't actually getting to some of the babies that could benefit the most from it, which is the preemies and babies in the NICU. So our goal was to make this book available to any family that had not already received it um, between the four month and three year visits. Um, so again, as part of EPIC, we have to identify and aim, and we write goals, dates, and how we're going to measure whether we've um, succeeded. Um, so the way that we figured out whether we'd exceeded is for every um, child's visit from four months to three years, we had this um, yellow piece of paper that went in the chart. And we just had to tick off whether the parent received the book. And then we asked them whether they'd received it, if they found it useful. And um, the themes that come out in the book is that activities that support language development are singing, talking, playing, um, reading, as well as other activities that you can do with your um, child. So we asked them, parents whether they were, um, which one of these activities they were doing with their child. And um, we learned a couple of things. The first was that even though the library thought they had a means through the educational sessions to give the books out, most of our families hadn't received it. 
we found out it was feasible to do within the clinic visit. Um, and there was only four cases where we were busy talking about other things and it just didn't feel appropriate. But for most families, it worked well to include this in their clinic visit. Um, we also found that for families who received the book, that they had incorporated many of the concepts that um, the book was uh, trying to um, teach parents about. And what you can see here is for families who had not received the book, which is on the left hand side here, um, only about a quarter of them selected the activities that were recommended. Not a big surprise. Whereas everybody who received the book had actually remembered the concepts that um, the, the book was talking about. Um, and we actually kept that going because it was such a such a success um, for us in the clinic, for the library, and for parents. Um, so then in the next cycle, when we're sitting around and having our monthly chats, we had to decide about what we wanted um, to do next. And so we learned from um, Dr. Sutton's talk that we have to think earlier. We have to think when babies are still in the, in the NICU um, about how we can support their language. And this was also an example of where the input from our parents was very helpful. They said, you know what, that first visit to the clinic when our baby's four months and you know, you're, you have to get out of the house and you have to remember the bottles and the diapers and you're a bit anxious about what the clinic's going to visit. Your brain is full. You, you don't have a lot of room to be taking in extra information that you're not specifically focused on at that time. But when you're in the nursery, um, you try to spend as much time with your baby. And during that time, your baby's sleeping. You don't always have things to do. So the nursery is a good place to do it. So um, we looked at where whether we could give information to parents, um, uh, you know, handouts when they go home. Do we do it during um, the educational sessions? But we had to acknowledge that parents don't actually attend very many of those. Um, could we do? Um, a talk to the nurses because it's with the nurses that the most parents are spending a lot of time. Um, and then we also talked about whether we could do anything online and there were some TVs in the room and could we use that, which wasn't very easy to do. So um, the nurses talk for the um, in the NICU came up as our next goal. Um, so, uh, we did this over a two week period where we wanted to increase the knowledge and awareness of the importance of communication, language development, and stimulation in preemie babies amongst the, the NICU nurses. Um, and again, when we wanted to look at what do we measure to see if we've succeeded, I mean, one was to see how many nurses, and we were hoping for 85%. But again, to see whether they'd uh, learned anything from the sessions, we asked at the end of each of the session, everybody to write down one new concept they learned and that they could see us implementing in the NICU. So uh, we actually met our goal of having 136 nurses, that's 85% who attended the six sessions that um, uh, that we put on for them. Um, and so we then had like 135 pieces of paper with lots of ideas on it. Um, we did try to sort all these ideas, which you can see in these various um, bars. Um, so we now have all these ideas of things we could do in the NICU. 
So when it came to the next, we felt rather overwhelmed. We had all these ideas. Where do you start? Which one do you pick? And what we decided um, to do was we were going to create a resource. So we um, created an Excel spreadsheet with what we called language um, tips. And so our goal was um, simply to create at least 15 language tips. And at the end of this three month period, we had a bank of over 30 tips. Um, which then led us to the next cycle is what are we going to do with these tips? And um, we decided we wanted to reinforce what we've been telling nurses um, in the nursery, as well as the other um, staff that work in the nursery as well. And in Vancouver, we have a um, weekly newsletter. It's called The Nice News, um, which gets distributed to, to uh, the whole neonatal program in the hospital. So our goal was to publish a weekly language improvement tip um, in the newsletter. Um, and um, that's what we did. And I thought that you'd enjoy some of uh, the tips. Um, now, when we, um, so this was the first one is consider all behavior as communication. Obviously, babies and particularly preemies, they're not going to talk to us, but they will communicate with us. Um, and so in the green circle and the red um, stop sign, um, we have examples about how um, babies can tell us that they're ready to interact or I need a rest. Um, so that was the first um week and now unfortunately we we had pictures to go with this um and we had bought a copyrighted resource to provide us with pictures which unfortunately i can't um share with you um so the next week was language development begins with nonverbal communication and we had pictures to show when a baby is saying, I'm ready to interact, which followed up. Um, uh, and then actually the next week we had uh, signs that the baby's not ready to interact. The following week, um, we uh, talked about how routines such as feeding and diaper changes can be seen as uh, communicative interactions rather than tasks. This isn't always um, obvious. Um, and so we encouraged nurses and staff to talk to babies when parents are present and it sends a really powerful and positive message. And I had a really nice story from a parent um, after I talked about this once. And she said, you know, the first time I heard the nurses talking to my baby was the first time I felt like she's a human being. She's a person. We talk to people. And so um, that's a surprisingly powerful thing to do. Um, in the next couple of weeks, we provided a little bit about the research that um, Dr. Sugden had given us with a take home message. Um, and in this week, it was you can encourage families to talk to their babies in the language that they are most fluent and comfortable speaking. It doesn't have to be English because that's what the nurses are talking. Use the language that you feel most comfortable with. Or one of our speech and um, language pathologists said, Speak with the language of your heart. Um, so the next couple of weeks, um, we got a bit more specific about um, 
preterm babies who were at different ages. So um, for the tiniest babies who are only 23 to 27 weeks, um, keep the area quiet and they like that quiet conversation, just like um, babies in the womb like to hear their mom's voice. Um, and simple, um, doesn't cost anything, um, but very powerful. And as uh, babies get to be a bit older or babies who are born um, at 28 to 29 weeks, um, parents can uh, spend about 20 minutes broken out over um, many times during the day of engaging with their baby by quietly reading, singing, talking, um, doing things like that. And by the time that they get to be at least 33 weeks corrected age, um, babies are typically ready um, to have about an hour and a half of positive engagement with things like reading, singing, talking. Um, so, um, and the next week, um, we reinforced the importance of repetition that's being important for learning language. And uh, as we learned from Dr. Sugden, babies learn well with familiar um, familiarity. So familiar speakers saying the same words, reading the same stories, and that's actually been shown to increase um, infant vocalizations. Uh, we also learn about human interaction is vital for learning language. Infants do not learn from screens such as smartphones, TVs, computers, and, um, and tablets, which is pretty intuitive in the nursery, but this also goes up, you know, the first year of life. Um, so don't think that your baby's going to learn by watching a screen. Um, and then we went on to talk about the importance of eye contact to promote attachment and nonverbal communication. Um, and so the importance of for babies to look at people's faces, um, trying to early on, it's just brief, but maintaining um, that contact during feeding. Um, and the benefit of it as well is that adult eye contact can decrease baby crying. Um, and moving on, we talked about the quality of interaction is more important than the number of words spoken. So that when you can combine talking with babies being able to see faces, hearing sounds, singing, touch, uh, movement, uh, that's high quality interaction. Um, and that's why kangaroo care is a great time for parents to talk or sing to their baby. So that's a lot of information, but um, what we learned from our process was that parents were a great addition to the team. Um, I hope these examples have given you an idea about how you can take small little projects and make them a manageable problem by setting a goal, making a plan, evaluating the results. And we also learned about um, the resources that can help us. Um, in our case, it was Dr. Worker's Lab, it was the Vancouver Public Library, the people in the nursery who were really willing to give talks, and unlike what had been published before that needed to spend a lot of money, we didn't actually, we needed um, commitment by staff, but we didn't need a lot of money resources. So um, we want to thank everybody, particularly um, the team in the Neil follow-up program and our parents, but also the people who provided um, funding for this um, study. Um, so with that, I would love to hear your questions. And that's my last slide. <laughs> Dr. Finn, thank you so much for your presentation. I always learn so much from you. It's amazing. 
And congratulations on this work. It's great and a lot of uh, practical tips for families, for sure. Um, so there's a few questions here. You talk about parents singing and reading the ICU, uh, especially on skin to skin. But if the baby cannot come out for any reason, if you open the potholes in the incubator, is that singing and reading is still effective? Um, yes. So the, the short answer is um, yes, that, you know, as babies going go from being um, uh, very tiny and premature and um, they may be sick, you have to read the cues um, and see whether they're show, telling you that, yes, I'm ready to interact. Um, and you are going to start off with um, being able to um, talk, talk to them, you know, when they're in the incubator. Um, we do know that you can do skin to skin care, even in some of the tiniest babies. Um, but it's important to work with the nurses and the staff because they're going to be able to tell you um, whether the uh, baby is um, ready for skin to skin. Um, but even early on, um, you'd be surprised. We can take babies on ventilators and bring them out and do skin to skin. Um, so if the team feels that the baby is ready, um, ask them if, um, when it'll be a good time to do it, do it. And, uh, from, certainly from my perspective, I think that's the optimal for mom, mom, dad, um, and, and baby to be able to talk and interact. Absolutely. Uh, it's so important. And obviously, in November, we've, it's uh, World Prematurity Day. The whole theme of the year is skin to skin from the moment of birth. And we know how many challenges still parents face in the hospitals who have the baby skin to skin, but we're never going to stop advocating for that. And it's so nice to, when you're skin to skin in the ICU and you're hoping to have the baby at home, but you are in the ICU and you can sing the lullabies and read the book that you do at home. So try to bring that experience into the into the NICU. Um, it, it's lovely because I remember when I was uh, in the ICU with my baby, I, kept, I sang to him two lullabies, the same ones for five months. <laughs> and I didn't know about the repetition that you're talking about. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Those are the only two that I sung the whole time in the NICU. And it's amazing uh, when we brought him home that those songs would play in the house or on the TV. He, he could feel that he was aware of those two tunes that I sung with my really bad voice. But uh babies don't care if you don't have a good voice as we can just sing and read uh it's so great so you talk about that you did mention the use of technology the ipads the tv can we talk a little bit more about that because you know, sometimes we come home and the tv becomes the babysitter for a while and we feel very guilt as parents are we not doing something good for them or what is your take on the technology because i did you did mention on your presentation so i think um the first thing is to is to recognize that by having the ipad the screen those things um if you know that that's you know, in your baby's environment, that's not the best way to help them learn. Um, now, of, of course, you know, if you have the TV on in your house while well, you're doing other things um, and so that you can listen to it, um, that's, you know, that's obviously um, fine. It's the, you know, it's the intent. Um, mm -hmm. And the Canadian Pediatric Society um, has, for all babies, you know, said, 
there should be no screen time in the first two years of life. Um, so yet, and I see it in the, in the clinic where you're trying to, you know, trying to get, um, an infant to, uh, collaborate with you. It's amazing. They, they kind of glob onto it and you can get them to be, um, quiet or you're trying to have a conversation or do something else. Um, and so I think in reality, everybody finds that there are times where it can be useful. But again, the important thing is you're not doing that because you're helping the child's um, development. You're doing it for, um, for other reasons. Right. This is very important. So let's talk about families who have uh, m multiple languages in the household or parents like me. We, we always spoke two languages in the house. Uh, what is your recommendation uh, when you have that situation for, for babies' language development? If you speak a second language, is it going to be delayed on their speech? So talk to us a little bit about that because this is a question that parents yeah. always comment on our group. Yes, I mean, we all know Canada is a multicultural um, country and it's not uncommon for um, families to have two or even three languages in a child's um, environment. And the I'm going to um, answer the question first from, you know, when it's you and your baby and they're you know and they're young um and that's where uh it's best to talk to your baby in the language that you feel most comfortable in and that's typically the language where you're most fluent you have the largest vocabulary um and you're able to just be more ex expressive so don't worry about using whatever language um, just feels right. And um, so don't intellectualize it. Go with the language that you, um, your heart says you should be talking. Um, the second thing is that children get older. Um, it's amazing. Um, you know, they're, brains are wired in the early years to learn multiple languages and so the the things that you can do that is going to help your child learn those different languages is provide them with um a setting so that if you have in your home um you're speaking one language but then you go and you visit um the child's grandparents, and they're speaking another language, then that makes it easier for the child because they can associate when I'm with these people in this home setting, then my brain's got clues to say, okay, this is the language I'm going to expect here. And then as they get older and they, for example, go to um, daycare or preschool, then maybe there's another language. Um, but keeping that consistent um, is the best thing you can do for the child um, rather than saying, okay, well, um, I'm going to speak English here and I'm going to speak another language and I'm bouncing back and forth. And then the child's sort of saying, I'm confused. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um so and, and that typically also works works quite well so you're not overthinking it um you just kind of make it consistent if that makes sense absolutely uh the next question is about hearing loss for the infants who have hearing loss what is the approach that parents should take for language uh to promote language well i think um, you know, it's important to get a hearing loss um, diagnosed 
as early as as possible because uh, then length um, it's certainly been shown that the communication um, and success at school and things like that you do better um, especially if you can pick it up in the first um, six months of, of life if that's when um, it's it, it's occurred but uh, you know, in my talk, I also mentioned the importance of using different um, senses so that if you're talking, but you're also using your hands, you're using your face, you're looking at them, you're touching them, um, babies, then if a child has difficulty hearing they're going to be picking up using their other senses as well um so that's another good a good reason to don't just talk you know from the other side of the room but that interaction and one of the things that i certainly learned is we tended to think of language just as well how many um, how many words does a child speak? And are they using sentences? And what's their grammar like? But no language is about communication, um, which, as I mentioned, starts with the nonverbal communication very early in life. Um, and so it's communication, it's behavior, it's interaction, um, and it's much more than just the words being spoken. Absolutely. So going back to your research now, what is the next steps to disseminate this knowledge on language promotion uh, in Canada? Well, um, Parent Epic has had um, several different um, aims. And so what we're sort of doing next is looking at the next steps across Canada of um, bringing in, um, I don't like, I mean, interventions doesn't sound right, but starting to do more things in follow-up programs that are not just about um, looking at whether how a child's development is doing, but what we can do to support them. So we're gonna go broader than just looking at um, language. Um, we have in CN Fund, we have put in an application um, led by the new director, Dr. Tui Mai Lu, um, about bringing in interventions um, to help um, early diagnosis and um, and helping children who have challenges with social communication. Um, and there's also in the last five years or so been a lot of new work that's come out on um, helping children with cerebral palsy. Um, and so we're going to go a bit broader and look at how we can bring that into follow-up programs across um, all of Canada. But the really nice thing um, about what we did with this study is everybody who participate has learned the techniques of, um, of EPIC and they've learned how uh, with some focus, you can make little changes um, and you don't have to make excuses that you don't have enough money for this and um, et cetera. So those are skills that are now imbued in the follow-up programs. Absolutely. And unfortunately, COVID played a bit of havoc with us because suddenly clinics um, had to change everything about how they did it and they had so um but yeah we've had some some sites who were just amazing and they love it and they said 
I mean, we're not going to stop doing this. Um, so hopefully that uh, that ethos of we can be changing, improving, and then that's something that doesn't just happen one day or one time. It's a constant process. Uh, will hopefully continue um, in clinics across Canada. Absolutely. Your work is, is truly amazing, Dr. Sins. And I'm going to share here uh, our website where we have a lot of information, new NATO follow up, and a lot of materials that we developed together uh, with your team for families across Canada. But I want to thank you so much for joining us here today, for sharing your amazing work, your expertise, and your passion uh, for the preterm babies. So I hope I see you again very soon. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And your voices are important. And we continue. Uh, look forward to continuing to hear your voices. Thank you, Dr. Sins. And to all of you watching us live today on our YouTube channel, Facebook, or Twitter, thank you so much for joining this session. And this video and the video of all our live sessions are available on our website, which is right here, thecanadianpremies.org. And I want to thank our sponsor, AstraZeneca, for their ongoing support of our live education sessions. And we are a charitable organization, and we believe that through support and education, we can empower families, ensuring they are ready to care for their babies. Please do visit our website and consider making a donation. Together, we can create a brighter future for all our babies. And I see you again next Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Stay well.